Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Mark Taylor, and I am a principal consultant at Risk Tech based in Aberdeen, Scotland. Thank you very much for joining us, and welcome to this Risk Tech seminar, which is the last of the fifth series we have been running since May this year. We asked you during the last series of webinars as to what topics you would like us to cover in this series. And as a result, we have been presenting the eight most popular requests. This is the last one in the current series, and it is about operationalization of safety cases. Hopefully we can provide some useful and practical insights for you. You also requested that web webinars should be slightly longer to cover a bit more detail. And therefore we've extended it to an hour with about 45 minutes for the presentation and 15 minutes for Q&A. So for a quick spot of housekeeping, we have muted everybody so that the sound won't be distorted by background noise. If you'd like to ask a question, and we do encourage you to ask questions, then please use the Q&A function. Just click the speech bubble in the middle of the controls at the bottom of your screen. To keep it simple, please don't use the chat function. I'll keep track of the questions and we'll aim to cover as many of them as we can by the end of the session and when the, within the hour we have available. Okay, I'd now like to briefly introduce this tech. I know you've probably seen the rolling presentation at the beginning of the webinar, but very quickly, um, risk and safety consultancy. And this is our 20th year. This is our birthday year. Um, so what do we do? We do safety and risk consulting. We do lots of teaching and training. We supply specialist engineers uh, to manage resources for other projects. Uh, we have an inspection service, and we also do research and development. Uh, we're located worldwide, and we have all Europe, the Middle East, and the Far East. I'd now like to introduce our speaker, who is David McDade. So Dave is a principal consultant based in our Glasgow office. He specializes in safety cases, general risk assessment, uh, um, and things like bow ties and Q. He's very knowledgeable. He's worked in several other offices, including a head office in Warrington and spent a number of years in Dubai. So I'm going to hand over to David, and he can he can start the webinar. And just to remind you, please uh, think about questions and please put them into the Q and A session. Over to you, Dave. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much, uh, Mark. Um, I'd just like to echo what, what Mark said there. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, af good afternoon, or good evening, depend depending where you are. Um, thanks very much for taking some time out of your day to attend the webinar. Um, glad to have you all here. Uh, as Mark says, you know, hopefully this raises some questions or thoughts or areas for discussion. Um, and if you want to put them in the Q&A box, then uh, Mark will compile them. And at the end, we can have a, a bit of a a bit of a chat about about the presentation. Okay, so as you know, what I want to talk about today is safety cases or HSE cases, depending where you are in the world. Um, we're going to talk about how to operationalize them um, or ways that you can get the information out to the people that you work with. So what we what we'll start with really, we're just best to have a quick reminder uh, of what we actually mean by a safety case or an HSE case. Okay, so a safety case is a document which uh, helps to review and demonstrate to all your stakeholders, whoever they may be, um, that the major HSE risks associated with our activities uh, conducted by our company have been identified uh, and of course that we have adequate adequate controls in place to manage these major risks and that other risk. 
So that's a slightly formal definition, really. But what what would an HSE case or a safety case look like? Hopefully, many of you have have come across them. But essentially, it's a document that will contain information uh, like a description of your facility, what's there, um, a description of the HSE management system that you have in place at the facility. Uh, it will contain uh, some information about formal safety assessments, which uh, will most likely be a summary of uh, various studies that you've done, which might be a QRA, which is a quantitative risk assessment. You might have bow ties, alarm studies, building risk assessments, dropped object studies, etc. Essentially, anything that's uh, that's relevant will, will be summarised in your case. So. You'll also have things about emergency response, limits of operation, uh, any other useful information. So really what we could say succinctly, uh, a safety case is a document which contains all the information about our facility and how we manage the risks there. What else is a safety case? Or you could put it another way, what, what is it not? Well, at the end of the day, it's only a document. It doesn't actually do anything. Um, you can see there my nice picture of a dusty book. So the act of producing it doesn't in itself make things any safer. Uh, and left on its own, nothing actually happens or changes. Unless, of course, we make people aware of it. We let them know how to use it. And we let them know how it applies to them. So what I'm going to talk about today a little bit is uh, I'm going to focus in on one area of the safety case, um, and that is HSE critical tasks. Um, so I'm going to use that as an example, really, uh, of what the case contains, how it relates to individuals, and how and why we should look to share that information. Okay, essentially, how do we stop it from just being a book on the shelf and look at how we operationalize it, uh, essentially embed the outputs into our day-to-day -day operations? So what does that look like as an agenda? Okay, so what we're going to start with is a review or a, a summary, I should say, about uh, what a safety case risk assessment and management process looks like. Um, the major accident hazards, what are these? How do we identify and manage them? So it's good for us to run back through that as a bit of a refresher. What are the safety and environmental critical elements, the SECIs, and what are HSE critical tasks? What does the output look like? What does your HSE critical task list actually look like? What are we actually producing? And what can we do with that output? Okay, and as Mark said, and I reiterated, a Q&A at the end. So feel free to ask anything uh, and uh, hopefully that will get some discussion going. Okay, so as I said, a good place to start is just to go back through our risk assessment and management process. Okay, so. This could be starting from scratch, really, uh, for, for a new facility or even the first safety case for an existing facility. It could be uh, revalidating or revisiting a safety case, but we would essentially go through this process. OK, so what we need to do at the very start is we identify hazards. So what do we have at our facility? What's there that uh, is a hazard? And by a hazard, we mean something with the potential to cause harm. So what we'd normally do is use a hazard checklist, which uh, the one there is too small to read, but I can assure you it's an excerpt from ISO 17776. And it's a big long list of hazards that you work through systematically one by one. Do we have this at a facility? Yes or no. And then if we do, what we want to do is assess the risk associated with it. OK, so that you'll see there a risk assessment matrix. So this is the means normally used to do that. So we look to plot uh, on the matrix the consequence severity against the likelihood, um, and that gives us our risk. So what's the consequence if the hazard was released and how likely is that to happen? Then that gives us a position on the risk assessment matrix. That position will be one of three things. So in this example, it's red, yellow, or green. Major risk, red, medium risk, yellow, low risk, green. Um, and you can see what we're doing here is we're starting to filter through our hazards and the risk level associated with them so that we can do different things with them. So for the red ones, the major ones, the big ones, what we want to do in order to manage them is uh, we want to record them in a hazard register of some kind. And then we want to demonstrate 
that we have control of these hazards and we will do that with uh, particular studies or techniques. So bow ties is the example I'm going to talk through today. A QRA there again, you'll see quantitative risk, quantitative risk assessment. Okay. And that differs from the yellow or green risks, which uh, are lower. So therefore they don't need quite as much attention. So we still record them in our hazard register and we still want to control them, but this time we would just demonstrate control through our HSE management system. Further beyond that, where we're taking you to today, I suppose you could say. So if we've done bow ties, and you'll see that this is not only the red risks, uh, but also perhaps the higher yellow risks, the, the higher uh, consequence medium risks, we would identify our safety critical elements and our HSE critical tasks. And we can do that using bow ties. I'm not going to talk about this today, but you would also want to demonstrate that these risks are managed to a level that's considered tolerable and a LARP, which is as low as reasonably practicable. Whereas for our lower yellow and green uh, risks, we don't really tend to need an LARP demonstration. Of course, we still manage them uh, and look to improve on an ongoing basis. So very quick example, if, I, if you think about, we start at the left-hand side, identify, we've gone through our hazard checklist. One of the items is paint. Uh, what we're saying, do you have tins of paint on your facility? Yes, we do. So what we would do is assess the, what's the risk associated with the paint if it was to come out of the tin. That might come through as green. You know, we don't want it to happen, but it's not particularly high consequence. So we record it in the hazard register in the bottom orange box there, and we would control it through a management system. So that would be procedures about using paint, about storing paint, about PPE. So that's how we manage uh, that kind of risk. Whereas again, if we start on the left-hand side and you think of something much higher risk, so say a helicopter or a, an airplane, uh, we would assess the risk associated with that. And obviously if something went wrong, uh, we're talking about a major, uh, major risk level here. So that would be red. We follow the red arrows through. So we're going to record it in the hazard register as we did for our paint. However, because the risk level is so much higher, so many more people can be uh, injured or, or killed, um, etc. Then we would want to do something else, which might be a bow tie, might be a quantitative risk assessment. And then the final box in blue on the right hand side. Yeah, we would want to identify some critical elements, which are pieces of equipment and critical tasks, which are things that people do that help to control that risk or manage that risk. Yeah, just to reiterate then, so, that, you know, our major accident hazards, we're talking about the red boxes on our risk assessment matrix, typically. Um, probably the yellow box there you'll see in the bottom row because the consequence is so high, it probably uh, counts as a major accident hazard. You might have a different risk assessment matrix from this. It might be different colors, uh, it might be different size, uh, but essentially it's all doing the same thing, which is to sort through our risks and categorize them based on uh, the risk level associated with the hazard. Some examples of major accident hazards then. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk through all of these, of course, but you see some things there. There's some general ones which would, you know, can be flammable liquids or materials that can be hydrocarbons or, or anything else really, toxic gases, vehicle crashes, environmental events, etc. Offshore, obviously some of the same things, but you know, you might have things like ship collision or, or uh, different other ones, but this is a kind of magnitude uh, of, of event that we're talking about here. At which would come come under the classification of major accident hazards. So as I said, the example I'm talking through today, really, we would be considering that we have identified our major accident hazards and we want to assess them using the bow tie uh, tool. Um, you can see the diagram here how it gets its name, very much looks like a bow tie in this uh, uh, format. So I'm not going to go into huge detail. This isn't a webinar about bow ties. We do have an earlier webinar which uh, in this series, which uh, I think was webinar number four, but presented by my colleague uh, James Stedden. He talks a lot more about bow ties. Uh, so you can look, look to that if you want more detail, but I will talk you through it just now. So what you see with the bow tie diagram in the middle, you have your hazard and top event. Um, on the left hand side, we have threats and the right hand side, we have consequences. So if we use an example, a hazard we've detected for our, or sorry, uh, 
determined is present at our site is hydrocarbon gas, then the top event might be loss of containment of that gas. Um, we would have threats down the left hand side, which would be how we could lose that containment. This could be things like corrosion or an external impact of some kind or some kind of error during maintenance or, or, or something similar. The consequences on the right hand side, you know, could be a, an explosion ultimately or, or a fire and this the uh, associated loss of life, um, damage to the plant, damage to the environment, damage to our reputation. But what we do have in between, we have the preventative barriers on, in blue on the left hand side, and we've got our mitigative barriers uh, on the right hand side in red. So there are things we can do to prevent the loss of containment or to mitigate the effects if we do have that. So what this is, is this is a bow tie from from a software uh, package. And you can see here that uh, the barriers get a lot more prominence in, in this case. And this is what we're gonna talk about, a lot about today. So these barriers here, you might uh, see them called control measures. Uh, you might see them called preventative measures. They might be called mitigative measures. They might be called safeguards. Um, but essentially we can define it as a, a device system or action that would interrupt the chain of events following the initiating cause or that would mitigate the loss events impact on the right hand side. So what this means really is these barriers are things or they're tasks that prevent us from reaching the undesirable event or controlling it on the right hand side after we've lost control. So even if you don't have bow ties in your organization or you haven't seen them before, you certainly be aware of hazards, of threats, of consequences and of the barriers that you have in place in your organization. Giving you, giving you a bit of an example here. So we'll look at the barriers in a bit more detail. What, what are we actually talking about here? So this example is an excerpt from a bow tie. So our hazard is hydrocarbons in our pipeline. Um, the top event is the loss of containment. So we don't want to lose containment of these hydrocarbons. So one of the threats that could lead to that is uh, corrosion. Um, and what we have is barriers in the way. So the barriers we have here, we have the design uh, of the pipeline in this case. We have corrosion inhibition, which is automatically injected into the line, and we have inspection monitoring of the pipeline condition. Another example of taking out here, so this time it's a car, the hazard is a car, transportation of personnel by car. Uh, again, a top event, so it's loss of control, uh, and we could have a puncture. A puncture is a threat that would take us towards the loss of control of our car. So again, we have barriers in the way. So this time we've said the tires are designed to be appropriate for the conditions, which will uh, prevent a puncture. The tires are inspected three monthly by a mechanic um, and the driver inspects them before each journey. So what we're, what we're starting to see, as I kind of mentioned before here, is uh, a mixture of things which are physical items of hardware and tasks, which are things that people do. Okay, so things would be the tire, uh, would be the pipeline, which are safety critical elements, are, are uh, items of hardware. And then the tasks are uh, inspection, monitoring, uh, and of course the inspection of the tires by the driver or the mechanic. Yeah, so as I say, we'll start to categorize them further. So we're calling them SECIs, uh, safety critical elements. These are our hardware barriers, our physical items of plant, uh, and these are managed through performance standards. Um, again, I would point you to the earlier webinar uh, that I uh, suggested by James Steddon, which talks about managing these hardware barriers, these SECI barriers. Um, we have the other ones, which are tasks, which is what I'm going to focus on a little bit more today. Uh, so these are tasks or human barriers. Somebody's doing something as a group or set of tasks or actions necessary to implement the barrier. Um, when we talk about these, we're going to get towards thinking about how we get the people that are involved with these barriers engaged with the case and how we get some ownership over these barriers. So this is my example from a minute ago. So that's what that can start to look like. Okay, so we have our original and then we've started to categorize things. So that's how it would look on a bow tie. You can color things differently, but in this case, I'm going green for the SECIs and yellow for the HSE critical tasks. 
you don't don't worry, you're not meant to be able to read this bow tie. I'm only showing this just as, and as an example of a larger bow tie, what it might look like so that you can start to see that there's a blend between yellow and green. So what we're talking about is a mixture of items of plant and tasks that people uh, perform. Okay, and again, if you don't have bow ties, don't worry. This is just showing you that there's a mixture of things uh, that control your hazards. Okay, if I go back to, this is a different example. So this time we're talking about hydrocarbons in the tank. Overpressure of the tank is a threat and we want to not have loss of containment of the hydrocarbon. So what we've got here is two green barriers, two Secchi barriers and a yellow barrier, which is our HSC critical task. So the first barrier, pressure relief valve on tank A1. So what is this pressure relief valve looks as below. The next barrier relates to an ESDV. There's the ESDV. And the next barrier uh, relates to a task. Okay, so what we're talking about in the final barrier, the yellow barrier, is a particular person, in this case, the control room operator, are doing a particular thing, which is responding to the alarm. So this is actually a person. So in this example, I'm going to just pretend that's me. So this might be me, Dave, who has to perform his duty in order for that barrier to be functional. So what the point I'm trying to make here really is that the barriers that we claim represent actual tangible things, which will be items of plant or things that people do. This might sound obvious, but when you're presented with a large amount of information, for example, in a bow tie, it's quite easy to forget that we're actually talking about physical things that are there and things that people actually do. Okay, It's not just words on a page, it's not just a pretty diagram, it represents actual items of plant and actual people. Another example here, this was our puncture, so transportation by car. I think you know where I'm going with this. We have a tyre designed appropriate for the conditions and we have our three monthly mechanic inspection and our driver inspection. So the first one, a secchi, it's the tyre. The next one is the mechanic doing his three monthly inspections. And the next one is the driver doing the pre-journey checks. So we've got one SECI and two HSE critical tasks. Another example, taking this a bit further, what we're seeing this time is we have four HSE critical tasks. Okay, so we're not relying on any SECIs. There's no plant in here. Uh, we're only talking about tasks that people do that prevents the threat from reaching the hazard, okay? So what we're talking about is the threat of operation and maintenance personnel not performing their job correctly, which would lead to a loss of control of the hazard. So as before, we can see that these are actual things performed by actual people. So the first barrier, it's the operations manager. He's responsible for that or she. The next one, asset manager, it's their responsibility to make sure that this barrier is operational. Supervision, that's the shift supervisor, and the technical authorities there at the end are responsible for the procedure. So what we're seeing here is competency, training on an ongoing basis, supervision, and procedures that are fit for purpose. So this allows the person to be competent to perform the task, supervised as appropriate, and that they have a procedures to follow. So this allows them to detect or think about the action needed and then to implement the action, okay? So this would all support me as a control room operator to be able to do my job. So the bow ties will have multiple threats which kind of all interlink. Something I'd just like to point out here as well actually is um, for those of us in the UK uh, or, or even elsewhere, you might have heard of safety critical task analysis, which is CTA, which is a particular uh, subject on its own. Unfortunately, there's a bit of crossover with names here, which happens often in our industry. So we're not talking about safety critical task analysis here. Uh, this is HSE critical tasks we're talking about. So just wanted to, to uh, get that point out to you. So what have we determined so far then? Well, many people can have many tasks to perform throughout their day uh, as they go through uh, their work. Some of those tasks as we've gone through our safety case process, our risk management and assessment process, we've deemed them as safety critical. And that is because 
they are a barrier against the major accident hazard. Okay, so there's our diagram from earlier. If you start on the left hand side, we follow it through, we get our red arrow, we pick it up, follow it across, you'll see that we've identified SECI's and HSE critical tasks. So the reason it's an HSE critical task is because it's high risk, because it is a barrier against a major accident hazard, okay? So we can see the route through quite clearly there really as to how we've got to our safety, criti our HSE critical tasks, I should say. Going back to my bow tie, again, not one that you're maybe, but this is just for illustration really. What we can do at this point really is we can think about each, each HSE critical task in turn and we can start to group them by the job role. Okay, so if we look there as we work our way through a bow tie, we look at the individual safety critical tasks, the asset manager might be responsible for these barriers. These will all be different, different things that the asset manager has to do, all spread throughout our bow tie. Operations manager, same again, various tasks that they perform that play a part in the management of our major accident hazards. Shift supervisor, yep, same again. They've got three tasks there. And then an example I'm going to pick back up on is a laundry attendant here. So you see that they have one task. So they have one task on this excerpt of the bow tie that we have deemed as HSE critical. Of course, bow ties aren't that small. Here we go, here's a big bow tie again. Yeah, so if you start to just expand it out, you'll see that there's multiple tasks for the asset manager, multiple tasks for the operations manager, multiple tasks for the ship's su shift supervisor. And then there we've got our one task for the laundry attendant. Taking it further, you might have a whole suite of bow ties, okay? So as we go through our whole facility, you're gonna have multiple bow ties uh, and you're gonna have, uh, as you can see, quite a lot of various different tasks popping up for the same people. You'll notice in the top, top left there, we have our, uh, our green one for the, for the laundry attendant. Okay. Yep, just to refresh us. So we'll just pull it back. We'll just pull it back. We're just thinking about this smaller uh, section uh, of the bow tie. So what we can start to do then when we've, when we've got uh, our information presented in this way, we can start to generate lists by job role. So the asset manager there, for example. So we've seen uh, where that person appears on the bow ties in charge of an HSE critical task. We can pull that information into some kind of list, that is a list of HSE critical tasks for the asset manager. Same again, operations manager, same logic, we're just pulling all the uh, operations manager tasks into to one place. I think you know where I'm going with this, shift supervisor, same again, there's all their tasks. Um, and then our friend, the laundry attendant, has one task, okay? so. These people might have loads of tasks, they might not have many tasks, um, but what we're seeing here in terms of the laundry attendant is from all of our assessment of our major accident hazards, there's only one HSE critical task that we have assigned to the laundry attendant. And we're reliant on them to perform that in order to ensure that the barrier is effective and that we manage the MEH. Okay, so this example, it might be we have worked our way through uh, the risk management process and we've identified that a fire from the laundry room as a potential contributor to a major accident hazard. Uh, so what we need them to do is to remove the fluff from the tumble dryer in order to prevent a fire. Now the laundry tendon, what they might have or what they will have I should say is a uh, many tasks to do as part of the daily duties. Okay, so if you've been offshore or you've been to a, a facility that, that you, uh, you, stay, you, you stay on site, then you, these kind people at the laundry will take away your clothes in the evening, um, wash your overalls and things, and then bring them back the next day. So this laundry attendant might have multiple things to do, 10 things, 20 things. They'll sort the clothes, they'll remove stains, they'll do sewing, they'll remove the fluff from the tumble dryer, uh, they'll respond to user queries, etc. Of all those tasks that they do, there's only one that we have picked out as being involved in the prevention of major accident hazards, okay? So that's their HSE critical task. We are relying on them to remove the fluff from the tumble dryers, 
in order to prevent a fire. So what I'm saying here essentially is we've got a responsibility to let this laundry attendant know that this is what is expected of them. Well, if we don't tell them, will they really know how important this task is? Do they know that they've got a role to play uh, in the major accident hazard management? Or is the removal of fluff from the dryer just something that they do uh, as part of their normal job and they don't place any more or less imp importance on it than, say, uh, performing the minor sewing duties? So what we have to do is tell them, um, of your 10 duties, Mr. or Mrs. Laundry Attendant, there's only one that we really need you to pay particular attention to that's an HSE critical task, and that is to defluff the tumble dryers. Okay, this is your HSE critical task. Of course, I'm using an extreme example here. All job roles will have a varying number of HSE critical tasks, but the logic applies. If we don't tell them which ones are their HSE critical tasks, how will they know which are the more mundane tasks and which ones we are relying on to be in place to manage the major accident hazards? So what we have to do, of course, is we have to communicate this information with them. So there's many ways we can do that. And what I'm just going to talk about here is just a few different examples uh, of ways that that can be done. So one of the first ways really is to ensure that the job descriptions clearly identify the HSE critical tasks for the personnel. So there's multiple reasons for that. I mean, it gives them the information, but also it helps to inform the competence that we require for that position to be filled. It helps to inform the job description if you go out to market to fill the post. So we've got a good handle on not only the tasks they perform every day, but also the ones that are HSE critical and how we can help them to perform those tasks. Presentations, of course, so, you know, like the one I'm doing just now, uh, people might need to know what is a major accident hazard? Uh, how do they fit into the management of major accident hazards? Where does the HSE critical task list come from? What is it that we expect of them in terms of managing their hazards? Um, and of course, not only is it what is expected of them, but also this is something that's written down in the safety case. So that information might be presented. So. It's only fair that if we name them, then we have to let them know what, what we're expecting from them. Posters, that's another way. I mean, uh, you know, what you can think about if you have bow ties, you might want to present bow ties. So what I've shown there is just an example about what is a bow tie. So this can be reference material that are available for people. In support of that, you can, uh, a lot of people put up the bow ties themselves uh, in strategic locations so people can go look at the bow tie, they can identify where, where they fit in, they can identify the barriers that are in place for a particular threat if they're looking to conduct a particular piece of work. So what I would say here really is, you know, I guess most of us have, have been in a workplace where we could have posters on the wall that have been there for, for 20 years and they've never changed, you know, it's just the same information. So. You know, if something changes, if we have created our HSE case for the first time, uh, if we have uh, revisited the safety case or HSE case, if it's been updated, um, then, you know, we can we can have some kind of campaign which uh, lets us roll out the material, get people re-engaged. And of course, you can explain what the posters are in daily briefings or, or through other means. Yeah, making information available on the internet. So, you know, uh, it's got to be in a easily accessible and understandable format. You know, people have to know where it is and what they're actually looking at. Um, you, you know, in, the, in that kind of case, you would need to let people know where it is on the network uh, and what they can actually find there. Um, the example there is a kind of user interface, if you like. So instead of just having a PDF of the HSE case or the safety case, which might be a large document, you know, it can be broken down uh, into different sections which let people uh, select what they want to see. So I know that's slightly small on the screen there, but you will see uh, in the supporting information about the fourth box down, we've got our HSE critical tasks by job role. So conceivably people could go in there, they could look for their job and they can remind themselves of what their HSE critical tasks are. You'll see the, the bow tie diagrams are also there. 
what I haven't put in the slide there, of course, is training. Um, you know, there's various different types of training that go all the way from basic awareness uh, right up to the expert level. But all you're trying to do really is to promote engagement and people do know what it is. They are, how they are mentioned in it, where their name comes up, if you like, or their job role name. Um, and what I would say here, really, in my experience, um, you're qu quite often pleasantly surprised by the level of interest and enthusiasm you get from people uh, when you involve them in things. You know, if you explain to them what, what uh, you're talking about and what a major accident hazard is and the role they play, you know, you, you, can, uh, you can be really pleasantly surprised by how engaged people get and that they want to play a part in uh, keeping everyone safe. Something else more, a bit more related to the HSC critical tasks. Uh, so we'll talk about booklets here. So, you know, when you've been to different facilities, be it offshore or onshore, um, quite often you are provided with a booklet which contains uh, information uh, specific to the site. So this might be things like uh, what to do if you hear an alarm, what the different alarms sound like, um, basic layout, where to go if you have to uh, muster in some way, you know, just all the basic information related to the site. It might contain information about major accident hazards uh, and the safety case. Um, but what I would say here, you know, there's nothing to stop these booklets being specific to the individual job roles. So here we have our old friends again, the asset manager, the operations manager, the shift supervisor, and of course, the laundry attendant. So what this would, this kind of setup would have a Booklet per role, each booklet would have the same information, the generic information, but then at the back end, it would have some additional job specific roles. So it would have their HSC critical tasks relative to their role. Of course, what this means is if you get a new laundry attendant on, on site, then what they get is the laundry attendant booklet, which would contain the generic information as well as the information which is more specific to their job role. Doing all that, then what you would hope is that you have gone some way to operationalizing your safety case. So here's a laundry attendant. So we've given them a booklet. We've given them access to the internet page with all the information in the safety case. There's been some kind of campaign uh, which involves posters and things. Might have had a bit of training to, to go with that. And what we are hoping is that then they would be able to say, I know what the safety case is. I know what I have to do, I know why I have to do it, and I know what my HSE critical tasks are. Okay, so we're giving, all the, giving the people all the information contained with the case, because for anyone that's ever been involved in the development of an HSE case or a safety case, there's a lot of work goes into it. So if we uh, fail to take that final step and engage people and involve them and let them understand what's in it, then it will end up just being that book on the shelf that I talked about at the start. Okay, so just going to summarise really. So, you know, as I say, we've done a lot of work going through our case. We might have bow ties, we might not. If we do have bow ties, we'll certainly have our HSE critical tasks uh, in a usable uh, format. What we've done as part of our assessment, we have placed the responsibility on individuals to manage our major accident hazards. However, what we have to accept is people may not necessarily know what a major accident hazard is, okay? So not everybody works in the same field. Uh, there's various levels of exposure to HSC cases and safety cases. We need people to know what these major accident hazards are, what it means, what they are. Of course, yeah, off the back of that, what the HSE critical tasks are, uh, particularly the ones that are relevant to their role. So therefore we need to share this with them, okay, which is the point of my presentation essentially. All the work that we've done in order to promote the ownership, we really need to complete this final operationalization stage in order to get the safety case uh, embedded in our day-to-day -day activities and to prevent it from being that book on the shelf that we talked about. Okay, yeah, I'd just like to uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you found something interesting there. Um, and what I'll do is I'll pass you over to Mark to see if we've got some questions from the Q&A.
Thank you, Dave. That was a really excellent presentation. Yes, we've got plenty of questions. I hope you're ready for them. Yes. Good. Okay, so um, they're, they're a mixture, um, so I can't really group them, but I'll, I'll start off with um, one from Sergio. Sergio asks, uh, well, it's a statement, but it's also a question. Mm -hmm. Barriers are usually shown in bow ties in the same sequence they are used or activated, e.g. Uh, first is operator response, second ESD, third pressure relief, etc. Uh, critical barriers are supposed to be close to the top event. So on the back of that statement, there's a question, is there a particular a way that a bow tie should be laid out um, with regards to how you position the barriers in the diagram and does it make a difference? Yes, yeah, so it's a, good, it's a really good point and I'm, and I'm glad you've made it. So essentially what you're thinking about when you're looking at a bow tie there, um, I, I, and um, I'm sure you're, you're obviously aware of this Sergio, but for the group as a whole, you're thinking about it in, a, in an order. What happens? How do we get to the middle where we lose control? So what you're best to do, of course, is to think of them in the accident sequence, uh, you know, what, what happens in what order. So like you say there, really, you would think that when a threat is there, the first thing that's got to happen is for it to be detected in some way. Um, and then there's got to be some kind of decision made um, and then there's got to be an action in order to prevent the threat. So I think you're absolutely right. Uh, yes, you would always really want them to go in logical order. On the right hand side where you've got a consequence. So this is we didn't talk about this much today, but this is when you've already lost control. Um, you know, if it's a, a gas leak of, of some kind, you've lost containment of your hydrocarbon gas, then there's still things you can do before you have your ultimate consequence of, of uh, an explosion and fatalities, etc. So again, you would think about it in the order. So what you would do is detect the gas in some way. There's been a release, we detect it, and then that can lead to various different levels of shutdown, etc. The further along you go, the closer you are to your, your uh, accident being realised, you know, and then that's when you start to have barriers like emergency response plan, which are attempting to minimise the damage um, and then at the very end you can have things like first aid which somebody's already injured and hurt but you're hoping to prevent that uh, from being a more serious injury or a death so absolutely it's a good way to think about bow ties if you read through from left to right you're essentially going in a time-based uh, order of things that happen and um, bow ties don't have the same level of uh, what would you say there's not uh, for example, an ISO standard, there, are, there is guidance, of course, but there, there's uh, a few different ways to do them, a bit more flexible. But yeah, that you can't go wrong if you follow that logic of, of doing it in order, time-based. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that response. Thank you for the question. Uh, another one, you know, a bit of a challenging question uh, from Dimitri. Um, how much do you think is necessary to include the hazard of COVID-19 in the HSC case as a major accident hazard in the current situation with COVID-19. Are there any precedents in your practice? So what do you think about the idea of including a pandemic, let's generalize it, pandemic and medical mm. problems within an HSC case or safety case? Sure, sure. I think, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll start by telling you is that on our uh, wall in our office um, in Glasgow, we have a bow tie for COVID-19. So that was developed internally in Risk Tech. Um, and what we are using that to is to allow us to think about the barriers and what we need to do and to remind ourselves uh, how, to, how to keep control of it. So that's one aspect of your question, really. Definitely, it's, it's possible to make one. Um, and then, yeah, you, you know, it's a very good way of sharing the information with, with uh, colleagues and reminding everyone what they've got to do. In terms of in safety cases and HSE cases, so I think, you know, things move quite slowly sometimes in, in these kind of these kind of worlds. So although the pandemic has been around for a while now, I think it was fair to say that prior to COVID-19, you might have found mention of pandemics in, in a case um, and what effects that might have. However, it would probably have been quite light and it certainly, I don't think, would have been brought up to major accident hazard category. Things have obviously changed now. Um, 
as we've seen the reality of what something this something like this can be like. So it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to write a safety case to satisfy a regulator, then you might want to take a bit of guidance from the regulator about where about how this should be managed. Um, if you are in a part of the world where you know you you aren't following or you don't have regulatory requirements that you need to follow, you might want to do it. You might want to include it in your case because you can do it if you think it's useful. In terms of, as I say, in the in the UK, things haven't really moved to the point where people are considering it a major accident hazard. But what I would say is if you think it would be useful to treat it in the same way that you do and you think it will help your people, then why not assess it as a major accident hazard? And by that, I mean, give it the attention that you give uh, to other major accident hazards. Do a bow tie, assess it, see if you're doing everything you can. And then I think whether you put it in the case or not is, is a slightly secondary issue. To some extent, you should maybe just see what the feelings are within the industry or the regulator in your own country. Thanks, Dave. Uh, following on the same theme, uh, really, um, how would we manage risks that are ex that we're exposed to outside of the workplace? So I guess you could relate this to the difference between being on an offshore platform where you sleep on the job in effect and working on a plant onshore where you go home. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so how do you reflect those in terms of safety group tasks, the, the ones that you can't control or the, the where you're outside of the management system, you're outside of the workplace? Can you do anything about that? Or should you do anything about that, maybe? Well, I think, you know, um, I've been, I'm sure Mark will agree with me here. I've been doing this long enough now that um, I probably drive my wife crazy because what what I actually do, unfortunately, is in my day-to-day -day life is you tend to apply both high type thinking to your daily business, you know, so if we were going to, uh, we got a new bathroom installed, so in my head I'm going, hmm, okay, well, what would be the consequences if that goes wrong? What would be the likelihood of having a flood? What are we going to do about it? Um, we're going to put a shower screen in. How heavy is it? What if it fell? You know, so I think I'm ingrained, unfortunately, in this. So that's an aside, but, you know, you, your case, um, covers the operations on your platform or, or whatever. Once people are away doing doing their own thing, uh, to be honest, it's, it's, it's something that you, you wouldn't necessarily be managing or controlling. As Mark says, if, if you've got people there 24 seven, then you've got some different considerations to, to have. You know, your people are sleeping there, uh, they're exposed to risk, which I won't go into too much, but if you're thinking uh, quantitatively, they're exposed to risk for a longer period of time than if they go home at night. Of course, going home every night presents its own risk uh, in terms of transport and things like that. So I know within Risk Tech, we've identified that traveling uh, and transport is probably the biggest risk to our personnel. So it all kind of fits in together, but it depends uh, where your responsibilities begin and end as an employer. You know, are you, are you running buses, which will bring people in to the plant. Uh, if you do, then of course, you've got some responsibility over the transport. But essentially, yeah, you can you can only kind of control what's what's within your remit, but that's not to say that you can't help people to think about how to keep themselves safe in, in all aspects. Thank you, Dave. Um, more simple question now for Mamir. Um, what are soft and hard barriers? Can you help define what you mean by those terms? Okay, yeah, yeah. So that's another one of the many, many terms, really. So uh, hard barriers, I guess, hard hardware, really, you can think about that. So that's our safety critical elements. So that's um, the items of plant, the the ESDV, the PSV, the tyre uh, from, from our car, and the soft barriers are, are the human barriers, which are the tasks that the people do, the HSE critical tasks. So it's just another way of putting it that, that some people might use. Um, and something that I would ask you to remember here as well is that essentially the safety critical elements are more reliable than people. So what we tend to say is an engineered system, an item, of plant is more reliable than a person doing something. So 
you, if you can, you want to have more green barriers and, and the examples I've used, more of the hard barriers and fewer of the softer barriers because the more engineered systems you have, the better it is. That was, <coughs> excuse me, partly why I wanted to pull out my example where we had only yellow barriers, only safety critical tasks, or HSE critical tasks, because what you've got there is You've got no engineered system to help you out. You've got no engineered system that is in place to manage your hazards. So you're fully reliant on the people. And if those people don't know that you are fully reliant on them and they don't know what they're expected to do, then you can see quite easily how a threat barrier can make its way into the middle and you can have your uh, loss of containment or loss of control of your hazard. Thanks. Um, here's a question from Syed. Um, is there a benefit to developing safety cases during the design of major projects? Yeah, so um, you, you may, it depends uh, really on, the, the, I suppose, the size of, of the project. So I was in the, the Middle East for, for quite a few years, as, as uh, Mark said, and there was some really big projects going on. So in these larger projects, they would have various cases. So they would have a design HSE case, they, they called it, um, design HSE case, and then you would have an operational HSE case. Um, essentially, it, it's a flow through, you know, you've all seen probably those diagrams where you have, uh, you know, you have your um, concept, design, um, build, operate, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can have different cases along the way. What, what you'll find uh, is as I say, it depends on the size of the project. If you've got a small project that's only going to be in the design and construction phase for two weeks, then you're probably not going to want to develop a case. Not to say you couldn't start thinking about your case and that you don't do the studies, but you might not produce a formal document. Whereas if you've got a five-year uh, project, you know, it's five years before it's even operational, then you might want to have a design and construction HSE case or something similar. And what you'll do is the studies that contains the hazards, the bow ties, the has ops, the um, alarm assessments, etc. You might want to revisit them as you bring your case through from from a design case to a operational case. But it's really just dependent on the, the, the size of the project, I guess you could say. OK, thanks. Uh, there's a couple of questions on Authorization of the safety case, that word I have trouble <laughs> pronouncing. Um, first, I'll read them together because they are related. Um, one is Am I correct in stating that the method this tech uh, uses for authorization of the safety case is just simply applying different color codes to the bow tie diagram? So that's one question. And then, related to that, if I can find it, just bear with me a second. Sure. Yeah, um, is authorization of the safety case different from implementing a solid process safety culture where everybody is aware of their role? So there's two bits. Is it just simply a matter of you know, color coding a bow tie or is it related to the, the process safety culture? Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, I guess first and foremost, the colours, you know, you, you, you might have seen uh, people that use bow ties, you might have seen the colours uh, used in different ways. So sometimes a bow tie, the colours will be effectiveness. So is the barrier good, okay or bad? So that might be, you know, green, uh, yellow and red tra traffic light system. So that's what colours you might see on it. Uh, you might see colours for who's responsible for the barrier or you might see a uh, uh, colours uh, depending on what what category of uh, equipment it is. That's another thing I've seen. So really, the colours can be added however however you want. So I've used them to my advantage today because I'm using the colours to show you what I want to show you. But that's that logic applies to everyone that's using bow ties. You don't have to stick with effectiveness. If I was giving you a presentation today about effectiveness, I would have coloured the bow ties to show effectiveness, but I'm not. I'm giving you a presentation about the tasks and the equipment, so I want to show that. So you you can essentially choose what you want to show, um, and that's something that I think kind of goes towards feeding into the operationalization. What are you trying to tell people? Are you want to show them effectiveness? Are you want to show them which ones are tasks and which are equipment? Are you wanting to show them who does what? And you can use your colors uh, to, to do that. So 
it depends what you're doing, but yes, that there's a there's a part to play. Show people what you want to show them. Um, in terms of culture, I think that, that's a really good question and a really interesting question. I think there's two two things going on. I think if you're in a, an organisation which has a really good culture of engagement, uh, process safety, people really understand what they're doing, that's nothing but a, a positive and that's great. What that doesn't necessarily do is tell them what HSE critical tasks are claimed in the case. So. There would be absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, it would be ideal really for the two to run in parallel. So you would, you would want everyone to be aware of process safety and what it is. But of course, you also want them to know what is in the HSE case um, and what you're saying that they're doing individually. Just all improves everything, really. The culture of sharing information, if it's already there, of course, it's going to lead naturally to sharing the case. Likewise, if you don't have that culture in place, starting by sharing the HSE case or the safety case and getting people involved and operationalizing it, if you like, is a start to change the culture. So they both feed into each other. Um, you can do one before, you know, if you don't have the culture, start with something like this. If you do have the culture, then this is great. This will naturally flow out of it and the people will be receptive and, and ready for this information. Okay. okay. So there is, there is more to it than just... Um... Just simply colour coding up a, a bow tie, then is what you're saying. Yes, yes, I would say so. Uh, use them, use them to your advantage. Use the colours the way you want to to show right. what you want to okay. show. Okay. So related to that is another question um, to do with the live in inverted commas monitoring of bow tie uh, barrier health. So is there a method um, using bow tie XP or other software is obviously available? Uh, where you could monitor the condition of barriers, uh, how effective they are, how effective testing is, are they overdue? So can you can you use bow ties to be related to ORAs and that type of process? Yes, absolutely. So there's, um, I suppose we'll start from the older fashioned way, if you like, the you know, but before we were quite so connect, uh, connected within the, the world the way we are now. Um, what you would do is you would take a snapshot in time and you would look at each barrier and you would go, how effective is this? And uh, people would tell you in a workshop, ideally, oh, listen, that barrier is not very good. You know, we've had problems with these pressure relief valves, for example, they're not particularly reliable. OK, so then you'd go, right, well, let's say that that barrier is uh, just OK ra rather than good. Um, you know, so you would go through them one by one. Um, Again, as Mark says, there are other Bowtie softwares available, but I know with uh, Bowtie, there's a product called Bowtie, uh, sorry, with Bowtie XP, there's a product called Bowtie uh, XP server, which is live, if you like, and you can update the barriers um, as and when they change. So as Mark says, if you had an ORA in place, uh, which is suggesting that a barrier is downgraded, then it can, in a live environment, change the color of that barrier or the category of that barrier. So it might be green before, but it might drop to yellow. The benefit of that, um, as I'm sure is the reason you're asking that question, if you have three items of equipment on a threat line, so there's three things that stop your threat from leading to a loss of containment, and one of them goes from green to yellow, it goes from good to okay, or even red, goes from good to bad. Maybe you can handle that. What if your second barrier, the same thing happens? And then what if the same thing happens to your third? So that's the benefit of kind of real-time monitoring, if you like. You can actually see not only if you lose uh, the effectiveness of one barrier, but how that actually affects the overall management of the risks and what threat lines become or consequence lines, what threat or consequence lines are jeopardized by, by losing uh, perhaps more than one system. Um, so yeah, really useful way. If you had to do all that manually, which of course you could do, then it would be a bit of a big job, but it certainly would give you live, uh, live information. Okay, thanks Dave. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time. So um, I think we really do need to wrap up now. Um, so uh, 